Judge Anthony Carter, a highly respected black man in his early 50s, had just wrapped up a long day at the courthouse. After presiding over a particularly intense case, he decided to clear his mind with a drive. Sitting behind the wheel of his luxury sedan, Anthony allowed himself a brief moment of peace as he navigated the quiet, tree-lined streets of his suburban neighborhood. The car was a reward for years of hard work and dedication to the law, a symbol of the success he had achieved despite the many challenges he had faced. Anthony loved the feel of the smooth leather seats, the gentle hum of the engine, and the way the car glided effortlessly over the road. It was a rare indulgence for a man who had spent his life serving justice. The night was calm, with only the occasional streetlight casting a warm glow over the otherwise darkened streets. Anthony's mind wandered back to the day's events, cases of theft, assault, and domestic disputes, each one a reminder of how far society still had to go. But as he drove, his thoughts began to drift to more personal matters. He thought of his family, his wife's gentle smile, and his daughter's upcoming graduation. Just as he was starting to relax, the sudden glare of flashing red and blue lights filled his rearview mirror, pulling him abruptly from his thoughts. A police cruiser had appeared behind him, its sirens blaring, signaling him to pull over. Confused but composed, Anthony signaled and pulled to the side of the road. He hadn't been speeding, nor had he violated any traffic laws. What could this be about? As Judge Carter sat in his car, the bright police lights flashing in the mirrors, a sense of unease began to creep over him. He had been a judge for over 20 years and had dealt with countless cases involving police stops, but being on the receiving end of one was a rare experience. Still, he knew the routine. He kept his hands on the steering wheel and waited for the officer to approach. The police officer, a tall, broad-shouldered white man in his late 30s, approached the car with a stern expression. His hand hovered near his holster, as though he expected trouble. Judge Carter watched through the rearview mirror, his heartbeat steady but his instincts alert. Something about the officer's posture felt off. There was an unnecessary tension in the air, and Anthony couldn't shake the feeling that this stop was about more than just a routine check. License and registration, the officer barked as soon as he reached the window. His tone was sharp, his eyes scanning the inside of the car with suspicion. Judge Carter remained calm, nodding politely as he reached into his glove compartment to retrieve the documents. Is there a problem, officer? He asked, his voice steady and composed, even though a growing sense of irritation simmered beneath the surface. The officer ignored the question, eyeing the luxury car with clear disdain. Whose car is this? He demanded, his voice low but accusatory. Judge Carter blinked, surprised by the question. It's mine, he responded simply, handing over the requested documents. The officer glanced at the license, then back at Judge Carter, his expression hardening. We'll see about that, he muttered before heading back to his cruiser, leaving Anthony sitting alone in the tense silence. As the officer walked back to his cruiser, Judge Carter felt a wave of frustration rising within him. He had seen this scenario play out many times in his courtroom. Black men stopped by the police for no apparent reason, often treated as suspects before any crime had been committed. Now, here he was, a respected judge, being subjected to the same indignity. Anthony took a deep breath, reminding himself to stay calm. He knew that reacting with anger would only escalate the situation, and he wasn't about to give this officer any reason to turn this stop into something more. Still, the underlying insult was hard to ignore. In the officer's eyes, it seemed that a black man driving an expensive car must have stolen it, an assumption rooted in deep-seated prejudice. The minutes dragged on as the officer sat in his cruiser, presumably running Judge Carter's information through the system. From his vantage point, Anthony could see the officer speaking into his radio glancing occasionally toward the car with a frown. Judge Carter knew that everything would check out. His license was clean, the car registered in his name, but that wasn't the point. The damage had already been done. As the lights of the cruiser continued to flash in the dark street, Judge Carter felt the weight of history bearing down on him. He had spent his career fighting for justice, working within a system that, more often than not, treated people like him unfairly. Now he was experiencing firsthand the very bias he had spent years trying to dismantle. When the officer returned to the car, his expression had not softened. 
If anything, he seemed even more determined to prove that something was amiss. He leaned into the window, the tension between them thick in the air. Step out of the vehicle, the officer ordered, his tone leaving no room for negotiation. Judge Carter hesitated for a moment. This was quickly turning from a routine stop into something much more serious. He had done nothing wrong, and yet he could feel the situation spiraling into dangerous territory. May I ask why I need to step out of the car, officer? He asked, keeping his voice measured. The officer's eyes narrowed, and he gestured sharply. Step out of the car, he repeated, this time more forcefully. Reluctantly, Judge Carter complied. He opened the door and slowly stepped out, his movements calm and deliberate. He stood beside the car, watching as the officer looked him up and down, his eyes full of suspicion. You don't look like the owner of a car like this, the officer said, his voice dripping with condescension. What are you doing in this neighborhood? The question struck Anthony like a blow. It wasn't just an insult. It was a reminder that, in the officer's eyes, his presence in this place, in this car, was inherently suspicious. I live in this neighborhood, Judge Carter replied, his voice tight with barely contained frustration. And as I already told you, this is my car. But the officer wasn't interested in explanations. He was looking for something, anything, to justify his assumptions. As Judge Carter stood beside his car, facing the officer's growing hostility, he realized that this situation was quickly becoming more than just a misunderstanding. The officer seemed determined to find fault, to confirm the narrative that was playing out in his mind, that a black man driving a luxury car in a wealthy neighborhood must have stolen it. It was a confrontation that Anthony had hoped to avoid, but now it seemed inevitable. Are you sure this is your car? The officer pressed, taking a step closer. His hand hovered near his holster, a subtle but clear indication of how he viewed the situation. Judge Carter's pulse quickened, but he remained outwardly calm. I've already shown you my license and registration, he replied, his voice firm. There's no need for this. The officer's jaw tightened, and for a moment, it seemed like things might escalate further. But before either man could speak again, another police car pulled up to the scene its siren cutting through the tense silence. A second officer, an older man with graying hair, stepped out of the vehicle and approached quickly. He glanced between the two men, immediately sensing the tension. What's going on here? The older officer asked, his tone more neutral. The first officer straightened, clearly uncomfortable under the scrutiny of his colleague. Just conducting a routine stop, he muttered, but his body language told a different story. The older officer turned to Judge Carter his eyes narrowing slightly as he took in the scene. Sir, do you mind telling me what happened? He asked, his voice steady. Judge Carter took a deep breath before responding to the older officer. He had been patient up to this point, but the weight of the situation was beginning to press down on him. He knew that revealing his identity could potentially diffuse the situation, but it also pained him to think that his title might be the only thing that could protect him in this moment. With a steady voice, he addressed the officer. I'm Judge Anthony Carter, he said, his tone calm but authoritative. The older officer's eyes widened slightly in recognition. He had likely heard of Anthony. Carter had presided over several high-profile cases, and his reputation for fairness and integrity had earned him respect in the legal community. But the younger officer's face remained impassive, as if he refused to acknowledge the significance of the revelation. The older officer immediately shifted his posture, his expression becoming more respectful. Judge Carter, he said, nodding slightly. I apologize for the misunderstanding. Let's get this cleared up. But the younger officer still seemed resistant, his skepticism lingering. We still need to verify the ownership of the vehicle, he insisted, his voice betraying a hint of defensiveness. Judge Carter remained composed, though a flicker of frustration passed through him. You have all the information you need, he replied, gesturing to his license and registration. I'm not sure why this is still an issue. The older officer shot a warning glance at his colleague before turning back to Anthony. We'll handle this quickly, Your Honor, he. As the exchange continued between Judge Carter and the officers, a small crowd of onlookers began to gather at a distance. The flashing lights of the police cruisers had drawn the attention of the nearby residents, and whispers spread through the group as they watched the scene unfold. 
Some recognized the judge, while others were simply curious about what was happening in their quiet neighborhood. Anthony could feel the weight of their stares, the judgment and speculation hanging in the air. He had spent his career in the public eye, but this kind of attention was different. This wasn't about his legal expertise or his courtroom rulings. This was about the fact that, in the eyes of many, he was a black man being confronted by police officers. His title, his accomplishments, none of it mattered in this moment. The younger officer seemed aware of the growing crowd as well, his posture becoming more rigid. Perhaps he felt the pressure of being watched, or perhaps he still believed that he was in the right. Either way, his tone remained curt as he continued his line of questioning. Where were you coming from tonight? He asked, as though it were relevant to the matter at hand. Judge Carter sighed internally, knowing this had turned into more than a simple misunderstanding. I was driving home, he answered, his voice still calm but tinged with weariness. I don't see how that matters. The older officer, sensing the tension in the crowd and the potential for the situation to escalate, stepped forward. That's enough, he said to his colleague, his voice firm. Judge Carter has already provided all the necessary documentation. Despite the older officer's attempt to calm things down, the younger officer wasn't ready to back off. His pride seemed wounded, and he doubled down, unwilling to accept that he might have made a mistake. I don't care if you're a judge, he said his voice rising slightly. This doesn't look right. A car like this, in this neighborhood? Before he could finish his sentence, the older officer cut him off. That's enough, officer, he said sharply, his tone leaving no room for argument. The younger officer bristled but fell silent, though the look in his eyes made it clear that he wasn't convinced. The tension in the air was palpable, and Anthony could feel his patience wearing thin. The crowd, now larger, murmured among themselves. Some shook their heads in disbelief at the officer's behavior, while others whispered in confusion, unsure of what was really happening. Judge Carter could feel the weight of their collective gaze on him, but he refused to let his frustration show. He knew that any sign of anger could be used against him, twisting the narrative into something it wasn't. I've complied with everything you've asked, Judge Carter said his voice calm but firm. Now, unless there's something else, I'd like to go home. The older officer nodded, clearly eager to defuse the situation. Of course, Your Honor, he said. You're free to go. We'll take care of the paperwork here. But as Anthony turned to leave, the younger officer's hand twitched near his holster, a small but dangerous gesture that didn't go unnoticed by the judge. As Judge Carter moved to return to his car, the older officer stepped forward, an apologetic look on his face. I'm sorry about all this, Your Honor, he said quietly, his voice sincere. I'll make sure it's dealt with properly. There was an awkward pause as the officer looked toward his younger colleague, who stood a few feet away, still bristling with defensiveness. Anthony appreciated the gesture, but the apology felt hollow in light of what had just transpired. This wasn't the first time he had encountered this kind of racial bias, and he knew it wouldn't be the last. The apology from one officer couldn't erase the systemic issues that had led to this moment, nor could it undo the damage that had been done by the younger officer's actions. Still, Judge Carter offered a polite nod. Thank you, he said simply, though his voice lacked the warmth it usually carried. He didn't want to engage any further. He just wanted to leave this confrontation behind him. The older officer seemed to sense this and stepped back, giving Anthony the space he needed to exit the situation gracefully. The younger officer, meanwhile, stood off to the side, his arms crossed and his expression unreadable. He didn't offer any apology, and it was clear that he still believed he had done nothing wrong. Anthony glanced at him briefly, a mixture of frustration and disappointment crossing his face, but he said nothing. Some battles weren't worth fighting, and this was one of them. As Judge Carter got back into his car, the tension from the encounter still lingered in the air. He shut the door softly taking a moment to compose himself before starting the engine. The flashing lights of the police cruisers continued to illuminate the dark street, casting long shadows over the onlookers who were still gathered nearby. Anthony took a deep breath, gripping the steering wheel tightly for a moment before releasing it. He knew that he had handled the situation as calmly and professionally as possible, but the emotional weight of it was still heavy on his shoulders. Despite his status as a judge, 
a man who had dedicated his life to upholding the law, he had been reduced to just another suspect in the eyes of that officer. The car moved smoothly as Anthony pulled away from the scene, the murmurs of the crowd fading behind him. As the lights of the police cruisers disappeared in his rearview mirror, he allowed himself a moment to reflect on what had just happened. It wasn't the first time he had faced racial profiling, but this time felt different. The fact that his position as a judge hadn't shielded him from this kind of treatment was a sobering reminder of the realities that still existed. As he drove through the quiet streets, Anthony's thoughts turned to his courtroom. He thought of the many cases he had presided over, the young black men who had sat in front of him, their lives forever altered by the biases of the system. He had always prided himself on being fair and just, but now, more than ever, he understood how deeply ingrained those biases were, even for someone like him. As Judge Carter continued his drive, the glow of the city lights casting long shadows over the road, his mind replayed the events of the night, the interaction with the police officer, the crowd of onlookers, the brief moment of tension when the officer's hand hovered near his holster. It all weighed heavily on him. He had spent decades advocating for fairness and equality, yet tonight he had experienced firsthand the prejudice that so many faced daily. He thought of the young men who had stood before him in court, many of them victims of a system that saw them as criminals before they had a chance to prove otherwise. How many times had they been stopped like he had tonight? How often had their stories gone unheard, dismissed as overreactions or simple misunderstandings? For the first time in a long while, Anthony felt the weight of his own privilege. He had his title to fall back on, but what about those who didn't? The more he reflected, the more he realized how far the system still had to go. In the courtroom, he had worked tirelessly to ensure that justice was served fairly, but outside those walls, the rules were different. Out here, on the streets, his title meant little to those who saw only the color of his skin. It was a sobering thought one that made him question how much change he had really made during his career. As the familiar side of his home came into view, Anthony felt a mixture of relief and frustration. Tonight had been a reminder that, despite all his achievements, there was still so much work to be done. He had dedicated his life to the pursuit of justice, but now, more than ever, he knew that justice was not something that could be found solely in the courtroom. It had to be fought for everywhere. When Judge Carter finally pulled into his driveway, the house stood quietly in the soft glow of the porch light. It was a place that usually brought him comfort, a sanctuary from the pressures of the world, but tonight it felt different. The weight of the night's events clung to him as he sat for a moment in the car, staring at the front door. His wife, Angela, would be waiting for him inside, probably with a warm smile and a soft question about his day. She had always been his rock, supporting him through the challenges of his career and the complexities of their lives. But tonight, he didn't feel ready to explain what had happened. He didn't want to burden her with his frustration, with the rawness of the experience he had just endured. Finally, he gathered his strength and stepped out of the car, closing the door behind him with a quiet click. As he approached the house, the cool night air helped to clear his mind, but the knot of tension in his chest remained. He knew that this encounter would stay with him for a long time, perhaps longer than he was comfortable admitting. Angela greeted him with a gentle smile when he walked through the door, her warm eyes immediately sensing that something was wrong. Rough night? She asked softly, her voice filled with concern. Anthony nodded, the words catching in his throat. He wasn't ready to explain just yet, so instead, he gave her a brief hug and murmured, I'll tell you in the morning. She nodded in understanding, but the worry in her eyes remained. The next morning, as the soft sunlight filtered through the curtains of their bedroom, Anthony lay awake, his mind still replaying the events of the previous night. He had barely slept, his thoughts consumed by the confrontation with the police officer and the uncomfortable truth it had forced him to confront. He had been silent with Angela the night before, but now he knew he couldn't keep it to himself any longer. Angela stirred beside him, her hand reaching out to rest gently on his arm. You didn't sleep much, she said quietly, her voice laced with concern. Do you want to talk about it? Anthony hesitated for a moment before nodding.
He had always prided himself on his ability to remain calm and composed, but today he felt the need to share the weight of what had happened. Sitting up in bed, he began to recount the events of the night, the traffic stop, the officer's accusations, the way the situation had escalated. As he spoke, Angela listened intently, her expression shifting from concern to disbelief to quiet anger. She had heard stories like this before, of course, stories of racial profiling and police misconduct, but hearing it happen to her own husband was different. I can't believe this, she said softly, shaking her head. After everything you've accomplished, everything you've done for this community, they still treated you like, like you didn't belong. Anthony sighed, rubbing a hand over his face. It doesn't matter what I've done, he replied quietly. To them, I was just another black man in the wrong place at the wrong time. As Judge Carter finished recounting the events of the previous night to his wife, a heavy silence filled the room. Angela sat beside him, her eyes filled with sadness and frustration. She reached for his hand, squeezing it gently, but Anthony could feel the emotions swirling inside him, emotions he had tried so hard to suppress over the years. It's exhausting, he admitted softly, his voice barely above a whisper. No matter how much I accomplish, no matter what I do, there's always someone who looks at me and sees a threat, or someone who doesn't belong. I've spent my whole life working within the system, believing I could help change it. But moments like last night make me question everything. Angela nodded, her own frustrations echoing his. I don't know how you've managed to stay so calm all these years, Anthony. I see the things you face and I can't help but feel angry. Angry that you, of all people, still have to deal with this kind of treatment. She paused, her voice softening. But I also know you. I know you won't let this break you. Anthony smiled weakly, appreciating her support, but the weight of her words hung over him. He had always prided himself on being able to rise above these experiences, to maintain his composure and dignity in the face of injustice. But the truth was, he was tired. Tired of being expected to stay calm, to forgive, to continue carrying the burden of racial prejudice without letting it affect him. I just don't know how much more of this I can take, he admitted his voice heavy with fatigue. Angela leaned closer, her presence a comforting balm. You don't have to do this alone, Anthony, she whispered. You've always been there for others. Now it's time to let someone be there for you. As the days passed, the encounter with the police officer remained fresh in Judge Carter's mind. It haunted him during his drives to the courthouse, while he presided over cases, and even in quiet moments at home with his family. He had spent his entire career upholding the law, believing that justice was something that could be achieved through hard work and integrity. But this experience had shaken him in ways he hadn't expected. One afternoon, as Anthony sat in his office reviewing case files, he received a phone call that would change everything. It was from a prominent civil rights lawyer, someone he had worked with years ago on a case involving police reform. The lawyer had heard about the incident through a mutual acquaintance and was reaching out to offer his support, and more importantly, to discuss taking action. Anthony, I know this wasn't just an isolated incident, the lawyer said, his voice firm but empathetic. This is part of a much larger problem, one that we've both been fighting against for years. You've always been a strong advocate for justice in the courtroom, but maybe it's time to take this fight beyond the bench. People need to hear your story. Anthony hesitated. He had never been one to seek the spotlight, preferring to do his work quietly and effectively from within the system. But the more he thought about it, the more he realized that remaining silent was no longer an option. The incident with the police officer had been a stark reminder of the deep-seated biases that still permeated society, and he couldn't stand by and do nothing. I've spent years fighting for justice from the bench, Anthony said slowly, his mind racing but maybe you're right. Maybe it's time to use my voice in a different way. If my experience can help bring attention to this issue, then I'm willing to do whatever it takes. The lawyer agreed, and together they began planning the next steps, a public campaign that would not only address Anthony's experience, but highlight the broader issues of racial profiling and police misconduct. In the weeks that followed, Judge Carter's story became the centerpiece of a larger movement 
aimed at addressing systemic racism in law enforcement. With the help of the civil rights lawyer and a team of dedicated advocates, Anthony agreed to speak publicly about his experience, sharing his story in interviews, community meetings, and public forums. His voice, calm and measured, became a rallying cry for those who had been similarly affected by racial profiling. At first, Anthony felt uneasy about the attention. He had always preferred to stay behind the scenes, focusing on his work in the courtroom. But as he saw the impact his story was having, particularly on young black men who had experienced the same kind of treatment he had, he began to feel a renewed sense of purpose. His story wasn't just about him. It was about a much larger fight for justice. The media quickly picked up on the story, and soon, Anthony's face was appearing on television screens and social media feeds across the country. News anchors spoke of the judge who was treated like a criminal, and civil rights groups used his story to call for greater accountability in law enforcement. Anthony's reputation as a fair and just judge only amplified the impact of his message. But along with the attention came backlash. Some criticized Anthony for speaking out, accusing him of using his platform to push a political agenda. Others downplayed the incident, claiming that the officer had simply been doing his job. Despite the criticism, Anthony remained steadfast in his mission. He knew that change wouldn't come easily, but he was willing to endure the personal attacks if it meant moving the conversation forward. As Judge Carter's public profile grew, so did the response from the community. On one hand, there was overwhelming support from civil rights organizations, community leaders, and everyday citizens who saw him as a symbol of resistance against racial injustice. His inbox was flooded with messages of gratitude and solidarity, many from people who had faced similar encounters with law enforcement. In particular, young black men reached out to Anthony, sharing their stories of being stopped, searched, and humiliated by police officers. They saw in him a reflection of their own struggles, and his willingness to speak out gave them a sense of hope. Anthony was moved by their stories, but he was also reminded of how deeply ingrained these issues were in society. On the other hand, there was also significant resistance. Law enforcement unions pushed back against the growing scrutiny, and some media outlets ran stories painting the incident as a misunderstanding suggesting that Anthony's race had nothing to do with the officer's actions. Conservative commentators criticized him for playing the race card and accused him of undermining trust in the police. Despite the backlash, Anthony refused to be silenced. He knew that speaking out was the right thing to do, not just for himself, but for the countless others who had experienced similar injustices. He continued to use his platform to call for meaningful reform, emphasizing the need for accountability, transparency, and training within police departments. Angela, ever supportive, stood by his side through it all. You're doing the right thing, she reminded him one evening after he had read yet another negative article. There will always be people who try to tear you down, but you're making a difference. Don't ever forget that. Anthony nodded, grateful for her unwavering support. He knew the road ahead would be long and difficult, but he was committed to seeing it through. As the public debate surrounding Judge Carter's story continued to intensify, tensions began to rise within the city. Protests against racial profiling and police misconduct erupted, with demonstrators taking to the streets demanding justice and reform. While most of the protests were peaceful, there were moments when the frustration and anger boiled over into clashes with the police. Anthony watched the developments with a heavy heart. He understood the anger and pain that fueled the protests. He had felt it himself after his encounter with the officer. But he also worried about the violence that occasionally erupted, fearing that it would overshadow the larger message of the movement. He wanted change, but he wanted it to come through peaceful, constructive means. One afternoon, while watching footage of a protest on television, Anthony received a call from the mayor's office. The mayor, a longtime acquaintance of Anthony's, asked if he would be willing to speak at a citywide forum aimed at addressing the growing unrest. The goal was to bring together community leaders, law enforcement, and citizens to have an open dialogue about the issues at hand. Anthony agreed, knowing that this was an opportunity to help guide the conversation in a positive direction. He had always believed in the power of dialogue, 
of bringing people together to find common ground. And now, more than ever, he felt it was his duty to use his voice to help bridge the divide between the community and law enforcement. The night of the citywide forum arrived, and Judge Carter stood backstage, preparing himself for what would be one of the most important speeches of his life. The room was packed with community leaders, law enforcement officials, activists, and concerned citizens. Tension hung in the air, with each group holding different expectations for what the evening would bring. Anthony knew that his words would need to strike a delicate balance. He had to acknowledge the pain and anger that fueled the protests while also emphasizing the need for constructive solutions. As he stepped onto the stage, the room quieted. The spotlight illuminated his face, and for a moment, all eyes were on him. He began slowly, recounting his own experience with the police officer and the emotions it had stirred within him. His voice was calm but firm, and he spoke not just as a judge, but as a black man who had lived through the same injustices that many in the audience had faced. I am not here tonight as a victim, he said. I am here as a voice, one voice among many, calling for justice, equality, and change. Anthony's words resonated deeply with the audience. He spoke of the need for reform, but he also emphasized the importance of unity. We cannot afford to let anger divide us, he said, his voice rising with conviction. We must come together, not just to protest, but to build a better system one where everyone, regardless of race or status, is treated with respect and dignity. As he finished his speech, the room erupted into applause. Some people stood clapping with tears in their eyes, while others nodded in agreement. Anthony had managed to capture the complex emotions of the moment, offering both a call to action and a path forward. For the first time in weeks, there was a sense of hope in the room. Following Judge Carter's powerful speech at the forum, the conversation around police reform gained new momentum. Community leaders and activists felt emboldened, inspired by Anthony's call for constructive dialogue and meaningful change. But as the calls for reform grew louder, so did the resistance from some within law enforcement. Many police officers felt as though they were being unfairly targeted, that the narrative around police misconduct had overshadowed the everyday work they did to protect their communities. Police unions issued statements expressing their frustration with the growing scrutiny, and tensions between the police and the community remained high. Despite this, some police leaders recognized the need for change. A few progressive police chiefs reached out to Anthony privately, acknowledging the systemic issues that had led to incidents like his, and expressing a willingness to work toward reform. These conversations were cautious, but they were a step in the right direction. One evening, after a particularly long day in court, Judge Carter received a phone call from one of the city's highest-ranking police officials. The officer expressed his desire to collaborate with Anthony on a new initiative, one focused on building trust between the police and the community. We can't fix everything overnight, the officer said, his voice earnest. But if we work together, we can start making progress. I believe you're the right person to help lead this effort. Anthony agreed though he knew the road ahead would be difficult. It wasn't just about changing policies, it was about changing mindsets. But he was willing to take on the challenge. He had spent his entire career fighting for justice, and now it was time to extend that fight beyond the courtroom. As Judge Carter and the police leadership began working together on the new initiative, the challenge of rebuilding trust between law enforcement and the community became clearer than ever. Anthony knew that this would be a long process one that required patience, transparency, and a willingness to listen on both sides. The first step was to hold a series of community meetings where police officers and residents could come together to share their experiences and concerns. These meetings were tense at first. Many community members were hesitant to engage, still harboring resentment and distrust after years of negative encounters with law enforcement. Anthony attended each meeting, often serving as a mediator between the two groups. He listened carefully to the stories shared by residents, stories of racial profiling, excessive force, and humiliation. He also listened to the officers, who spoke of the challenges they faced on the job and the fear they felt as the public's perception of them continued to worsen. At one particularly heated meeting, a young black man stood up and addressed the room, his voice shaking with anger. 
I've been stopped by the police more times than I can count, he said, glaring at the officers across from him. You don't see me as a person. You see me as a threat. Why should I trust you? The room fell silent, the weight of the young man's words hanging in the air. For a moment, no one spoke. Then one of the officers, an older man with a weathered face, stood up. You're right, he said quietly. We've made mistakes, and I'm sorry for the pain we've caused. His words weren't a solution, but they were a start. As the initiative gained traction, Judge Carter found himself spending more and more time on the road, attending meetings, giving speeches, and working tirelessly to bridge the gap between the police and the community. His role as a mediator had become one of the most important and challenging responsibilities of his career. But with the increased demands came personal sacrifices. Anthony's time at home with his family grew increasingly limited, and the strain began to show. Angela, ever supportive, understood the importance of the work he was doing, but she missed the quiet evenings they used to share together. Their daughter, Maya, who was preparing to leave for college, also felt the absence of her father. One evening, after returning home late from a particularly difficult meeting, Anthony found Angela sitting at the kitchen table, waiting for him. We need to talk, she said gently, her voice full of love but also concern. Anthony sat down, knowing what was coming. I know how important this is to you, Anthony. I know you're doing it for the right reasons. But we miss you. Maya misses you. Anthony sighed, running a hand through his hair. I know, he said quietly. I miss you both too. But this work, it's so important. If we don't do something now, things will only get worse. Angela nodded, her eyes softening. I know, and I'm proud of you. But just don't forget that we're here too. We need you. It was a conversation Anthony had been avoiding, but he knew she was right. As much as he wanted to dedicate every moment to the cause, he couldn't lose sight of the people who mattered most. It was a delicate balance, one he was still trying to figure out. In the months that followed, Judge Carter and the police leaders continued their efforts to rebuild trust within the community. The community meetings had been a good start, but Anthony knew that real change would require more than just conversations. It would require action. Working with the police chief, Anthony helped to develop new training programs focused on de-escalation tactics and cultural sensitivity. These programs aimed to address the very biases that had led to his own encounter with the police officer and countless others like it. Officers were trained to approach situations with empathy and understanding rather than suspicion and aggression. But Anthony also knew that training alone wouldn't solve the problem. There needed to be accountability. To that end, he worked with local lawmakers to push for the creation of independent oversight boards that would investigate allegations of police misconduct. These boards would be made up of community members, ensuring that the people most affected by police actions had a voice in the process. At the same time, Anthony continued to advocate for systemic changes at the state and national levels. He gave testimony before legislative committees calling for reforms that would hold law enforcement agencies accountable for patterns of abuse and discrimination. His voice, once confined to the courtroom, was now being heard by lawmakers across the country. Despite the progress being made, Anthony knew there was still much work to be done. The road ahead was long, and the resistance to change was strong. But with each step forward, he felt a renewed sense of purpose. This was the work he had been meant to do all along not just in the courtroom, but in the fight for justice everywhere. Late one night, after a long day of meetings and phone calls, Anthony sat in his home office, reflecting on everything that had happened since the night of the traffic stop. The incident that had initially filled him with frustration and anger had sparked something much bigger, something he hadn't anticipated. He thought about the countless people he had met along the way, community members, activists, police officers, and lawmakers, all working toward the same goal, even if their approaches differed. The movement for change was growing, and while progress was slow, it was undeniable. Anthony felt proud to be a part of it, but he also felt the weight of the responsibility that came with it. As he sat in the quiet of his office, Anthony thought back to his early days as a judge, when he had believed that justice could be achieved within the confines of the courtroom. But now he knew that justice was bigger than any one institution 
It was something that had to be fought for in every corner of society, in the streets, in the halls of power, and in the hearts and minds of the people. Angela appeared in the doorway, her smile soft and understanding. You're thinking too much again, she teased gently. Anthony chuckled, shaking his head. I guess I can. The new reforms, especially the training programs and oversight boards, began to show results in the community. Incidents of racial profiling and police misconduct were slowly declining. The relationship between law enforcement and the community, once strained and adversarial, was starting to shift toward mutual respect and trust. Judge Carter had played a pivotal role in making that happen, and he was proud of the progress that had been made. Still, not everyone was on board. There were factions within the police force who resisted the changes, viewing them as an attack on their authority. Some officers continued to push back, arguing that the new measures made their jobs more difficult and put them at greater risk. Anthony knew that change would take time and that not everyone would be won over immediately. But for every critic, there were others, both in the community and in law enforcement, who were ready to move forward. One evening, as Anthony reviewed the latest data on the impact of the reforms, he received a call from the police chief. We're seeing fewer complaints, the chief said, his voice carrying a note of optimism. People are starting to trust us again, and it's because of the work you've done, Judge. Anthony felt a wave of satisfaction, but he knew this was just one step in a longer journey. There's still more to do, he replied, his voice steady, but we're on the right path. The chief agreed. And for the first time, Anthony allowed himself to feel a sense of hope for the future. Want to follow more stories of justice and reform? Subscribe to the channel for updates on Anthony's journey. As news of the success of Anthony's initiative spread, his work began to gain national attention. Invitations to speak at conferences and on national news programs started flooding in. His message of justice, reform, and unity was resonating with people across the country. What had started as a local initiative was now becoming a model for other cities struggling with similar issues of police misconduct and racial bias. One day, Anthony was invited to appear on a prominent news show to discuss the progress of his efforts. As he sat under the bright studio lights, answering questions about the reforms, he realized just how far his journey had taken him. The story of the traffic stop that had once filled him with anger had now become a catalyst for change on a much larger scale. The interviewer, a well-known journalist, asked Anthony how he had managed to maintain his composure and focus on constructive solutions in the face of such personal injustice. Anthony smiled thoughtfully before answering, I've learned that anger, while justified, can't be the end of the conversation. It has to lead to action. We can't just be mad at the system, we have to change it. As the segment ended, Anthony left the studio feeling energized. His voice was being heard and change was happening, but he knew that the real work wasn't done in front of cameras. It was in the community with the people. Don't miss the next chapter of this journey. Subscribe now to stay informed about Anthony's fight for justice and reform. With national recognition came a new set of challenges. As Judge Carter's profile grew, so did the backlash from those who opposed his message. Online forums were flooded with hateful comments, some dismissing him as a race baiter, while others went further, making threats against him and his family. Anthony had known that speaking out would come with risks, but the intensity of the vitriol still took him by surprise. Angela, ever his support, urged him to be cautious. People can be dangerous when they feel threatened, she warned, her eyes filled with worry. Anthony nodded, understanding the risks, but refusing to back down. I won't let them scare me into silence, he said firmly. We're making progress, and that's what matters. The threats only seemed to strengthen Anthony's resolve. He continued to push for reform, meeting with lawmakers, activists, and law enforcement leaders. Still, the stress was taking a toll on him and his family. There were nights when Anthony would sit quietly in his office, replaying the threats in his mind, wondering if he was putting his loved ones in danger. But each morning, he would rise with the same determination. The work he was doing was too important to be derailed by fear. He knew that real change required courage, and he was willing to stand in the face of adversity. Stay connected to Anthony's inspiring journey by subscribing to the channel. This fight for justice is far from over.
Despite the challenges, Anthony began to find a new sense of peace. The constant tension of his work, the pressure to maintain calm in the face of opposition, it had been wearing him down. But as he continued to push forward, he began to realize that change, while slow, was indeed happening. The stories of young black men who had been treated with dignity by the police instead of suspicion began to surface, and these stories fueled him. One evening, while reviewing some case studies from the police department, Anthony came across a report about a young man who had been stopped by the police but had been treated respectfully and allowed to go on his way without incident. The man had written a letter to the police chief, thanking the officers for their professionalism. As he read the letter, Anthony felt a wave of emotion. This was why he had started this journey, to see moments like this, where young men who looked like him were treated with the respect they deserved. The small victories were adding up, and while the road ahead was still long, this was the proof that things were moving in the right direction. For the first time in months, Anthony allowed himself to truly believe that lasting change was possible. Be part of the movement. Subscribe to follow the journey and see how small victories can lead to big change. One day, while speaking at a public event on police reform, Anthony saw a familiar face in the crowd. It was the young officer who had stopped him that night, the officer who had refused to believe that Anthony could own the car he was driving. For a moment, Anthony felt a surge of anger, remembering how it had all started. But then, something unexpected happened. The officer approached him, his posture nervous but sincere. Judge Carter, the officer began, his voice shaky, I owe you an apology. I've been thinking about that night for a long time, and I realize now how wrong I was. I let my biases get in the way, and I'm sorry. His words were genuine, and Anthony could see the regret in his eyes. For a long moment, Anthony said nothing. He had imagined this moment many times, but now that it was here, he wasn't sure how to respond. Finally, he extended his hand. Thank you he said quietly. I appreciate your apology, and I hope you've learned from it. The officer nodded, looking relieved. I have, he said. I'm trying to do better. As they parted ways, Anthony felt a strange sense of closure. The man who had once seen him as nothing more than a suspect had now come forward to admit his mistake. It was a small moment, but it felt significant. The road to change was long and difficult, but moments like this gave Anthony hope. For more stories of transformation and accountability, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for what's next. As Judge Carter reflected on the journey he had been on since that fateful night, he knew that the work was far from over. The changes he had helped bring about were just the beginning. There was still so much more to be done, both in the community and within law enforcement. But for the first time, Anthony felt optimistic about the future. He had seen the impact of his work, both in the lives of the people he had touched and in the gradual changes within the police department. He had faced down fear, resistance, and personal attacks, but he had never lost sight of his goal, to create a world where justice was truly blind and where every person, regardless of race, was treated with respect and dignity. As he prepared for his next steps, more meetings, more speeches, more work, Anthony felt a deep sense of purpose. This was what he had been meant to do. The courtroom had been his battleground for many years, but now he realized the fight for justice extended far beyond the walls of the courthouse. And as long as there was work to be done, Anthony would be there, leading the charge. The journey continues. Subscribe to the channel and be part of the ongoing fight for justice and equality.